how does a human with two legs and two arms and a head create a physiology which is capable of running a two-hour marathon? The first really important task is to pick your parents correctly. You've got to be born to, to, to run that fast. You can work as hard as you want and you can pull in all the science, but the thing we won't, don't want to do is say, oh, Kipchoge ran a sub-two-hour marathon because there was a bunch of science and it made it easy. It's like, no, there's still only one human in the world who could have done this. There's, you know, all the other great runners in the world, you know, massively talented, have worked hard. They're still not at Kipchoge's level. Kipchoge is a super special guy. He's got the physical tools and maybe just as importantly, or at least part of the package, he's got the mental tools. He's been at the top since 2003. He won a world championships as a teenager 16 years ago. And that's unheard of. Nobody has that sort of, or almost nobody has that sort of longevity. Alex Hutchinson has joined us again. Alex, welcome to the show. Thanks a lot, Chris. It's great to be back. It is timely to talk about endurance and running. This is the, where the, like, the genesis point of the the new world of running right now, right? Yeah, it's it's uh, it's certainly an exciting time. Put it this way, I, I I did Canadian radio this morning. I'm talking to you, talking to New Zealand radio in a few hours, and then Australia a few hours after that. So people are talking about endurance right now, and hey, I'm 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 happy to see it. I bet you are. So for those of you who don't already follow Alex, if you have even the slightest interest in running, at Sweat Science on Twitter. Ever since the podcast that we did at the start of the year, I only follow, I think I follow like 82 people or something on Twitter. Um, so you make up more than like about 2% of probably what, what I see on Twitter right. every day. Um, <laughs> and the articles that you've been putting out recently have been fascinating. So we're going to go through um, Elliot Kipchoge's recent uh, marathon performance. Um, there's some really awesome breakdowns that you've done in the build up to that and then afterward. Um, then we're going to talk about some other records that have been broken. There's some uh, controversy surrounding the shoes and the kit that people have been wearing. So we got uh, we got a lot to get through today. It's going to be exciting. Fantastic! Yeah, it's been a, it's been a busy week, so uh, we'll have lots to talk about. <laughs> cool. So let's let's start with uh, Kipchoge's most recent performance. Let's say that someone somewhere has been living under a rock uh, and doesn't know what's happened. Can you describe what the Ineos uh, 159 challenge was? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, the big headline, the top headline is a, a human being ran less than or faster than two hours for 42.2 kilometers, 26.2 miles, uh, the marathon distance. Uh, the second headline is, but it wasn't a world record. It's not an <laughs> official world record. It was it was not doesn't count under the official rules. And that's where things start getting a little a little uh, tricky. So, this was this race was a an exhibition race held on uh, streets in Vienna, a, a park in in a park in Vienna. Um, only one competitor, Elliot Kipchoge, who is the reigning Olympic champion and official world record holder. But every possible thing anyone could imagine to make him faster was done. The, the reported budget. This is just rumors. The reported budget was fifteen million pounds for this one race by one person, and so. This is what made it exciting and interesting for for people like me who are interested in the sort of the science of endurance, but also made it controversial, made it, you know, people felt it was a bit of a stunt, a marketing stunt, maybe even a sport washing stunt for Ineos. Um, But so they had, you know, they had an electric car driving in front of them at exactly two hour marathon pace, shining lasers on the ground so that his teams of you know, a t- there were a total of 41 world-class runners who were serving as pacemakers for him, blocking the wind in in teams of, I, I think it was uh, one, two, three, four, five, I think seven pacemakers at a time were trying to, you know, en- encompass him or, or cocoon him from the, the forces of, of, of drag. Uh, and they were, I knew exactly where to run because the, the car was shining lasers on the ground. Um, you know, he had, um, a, a guy on a bicycle handing him water bottles every few kilometers, which is instead of, you know, he didn't want to slow him down by having to pick up a bottle off the table. And he had these wacky uh, prototype shoes on that nobody else ha- or basically nobody else has has seen or run in, which are the latest iteration of a pair of shoes called the Nike Vaporfly, which in the last three years has basically rocked the running world and totally reshaped what people think shoes are capable of doing for us. So all this stuff is boiled into, you know, 
people didn't think he could do it. People aren't sure whether it's fair. People aren't sure whether it's a good or a bad thing that we've got this exhibition event that won't count as a world record. And so basically everyone in the running world is having a big, massive brawl about it. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine there's so many different people, right? Because for me as someone who I don't have a, apart from entertainment and a, a genuine interest in sport and fitness, I don't have a side here. Um, I would, you know, if someone could run a one hour marathon, like sweet, like, oh, he had, he had rockets on his feet, but you know, he still ran it or whatever. Like, I just want the entertainment value, but I imagine there's some sport purists out there who are going to be much more critical. Um, so to set the scene, no matter what the shoe is and the, the track and, and the paces and the car and stuff like that, how does someone, how does a human with two legs and two arms and a head create a physiology which is capable of running a two-hour marathon yeah so the, the first really important task is to pick your parents correctly you need you've got to be born to, to to run that fast there's only you know you can work as hard as you want and you can pull in all the science but the only person you know the 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 thing we don't want to do is say, oh, Kipchoge ran a sub two hour marathon because there was a bunch of science and it made it easy. It's like, no, there's still only one human in the world who could have done this. There's, you know, all the other great runners in the world, you know, massively talented, have worked hard. They're still not at Kipchoge's level. Kipchoge is a super special guy. He's got the physical tools and maybe just as importantly, or at least part of the package, he's got the mental tools. He's got, he, he's been at the top since 2003. He won a world championships as a teenager 16 years ago. Uh, and that's unheard of. Nobody has that sort of, or almost nobody has that sort of longevity. So he's been, he's the classic, he, he grew up in the Rift Valley uh, of Kenya and at, at, at altitude. Um, it's, it's a total cliche for world beater runners, but, you know, running back and forth from school, hugely active as a kid, uh, accumulating more training as a, you know, as an eight year old than most like university age runners, even serious runners in Canada where I am or in, in Britain w would, and then started training seriously. He's been doing it year after year, week after week, hundreds, you know, he was running, uh, reportedly in the, in the neighborhood of 140 miles a week leading up to this. So that's, we're talking well over 200 kilometers a week. Some of that at a relaxed pace, some of that at an absolutely inhumanly fast pace. <laughs> and, 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 you know, one of the cool things, I think one of the things that makes people root for Kipchoge is he got a lot of publicity two years ago. There was a very similar attempt sponsored by Nike called Breaking 2, where he came within 25 seconds that time of breaking two hours. And there was a documentary that that uh, National Geographic put out about his preparations for that. And it gave people a window onto this guy who is probably one of the richest men in Kenya. Uh, he has a wife and a few kids. He visits them on weekends, but he spends his weekdays at this totally Spartan training camp where he lives with other runners. Uh, you know, it's just like, it's not quite mud hut, but it's it's absolutely Spartan. He, you know, they have a roster. He takes turns, you know, mopping out the toilet, washing from, you know, getting water from the well and washing from it. You know, he could live like an absolute sultan there, but he is a very simple guy and he's got all these aphorisms about how, you know, if you don't control your mind, your mind controls you. And so he's just, uh, he, he's totally focused on performance and he, he lives this hard life, a very simple life, trains. And uh, so this is a long answer, but the, the point is it, at this moment has been, you know, not years in the making, but decades in the making. And, and he's worked very, very hard to to become the, the you know, absolute running machine that he is now. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that fascinates me and a lot of people with Kipchoge is the fact that he has this monastic, very zen-like transcendent uh quality that he dis how he talks about his sport or uh, it's not even his sport is its life or his calling whatever he wants to refer to it as um but then he gets thrust into this world where there's a guy on a bike giving him water during the race then when they takes the bottle of water back they measure how much water's been <laughs> drank uh, offset how much he, they know he needs because they've done muscle fiber tests to work out how much he dehydrates. So you have this this beautiful kind of yin and yang of the the real technological cutting edge stuff that's attached to someone who has this purity, uh, very back to basics approach to running. I think that's what makes it interesting. 
You, you're absolutely right. There's this amazing juxtaposition. And so, you know, two years ago when he was doing this first Nike race, I had a chance to chat with him a few times. And, you know, I was, I'm a science journalist. So I was like, I want to know all about the formulation of the, the, the drink you're using and, and, you know, how are you going to alter your, your training distribution, blah, blah, blah. And he's a smart guy. Like he, he, he knows what's going on. Uh, so I, I don't want to make it sound like he's just like, oh, the scientists take care of it. But he knows what his job was and he knows the science was not his job. So he was able to, in the midst of, of this sort of massively scientific and, and let's face it, commercial enterprise, his job was just to, to, uh, to run and to look within himself and, and, you know, learn to push his limits. And he was able to maintain that. So I would ask him all these questions. He'd be like, yeah, that stuff's important. And I leave that to the scientific team. My job is to, is to train my mind and be ready to go. And I think that's one of the, you know, I think when Nike chose him two years ago, they were lucky that, that they got him because that's one of the reasons this whole endeavor has this sort of magical feeling to it. Mm. Uh, and, and rather than feeling like a sort of Barnum and Bailey, like step right up and see the, the, you know, the fattest woman in the world or whatever. Mm. It's like, he, he gives it a purity because he really like, he, he comes off as absolutely sincere. So what you said, I think that juxtaposition is absolutely fascinating. He's a great guy. Um, so just before we get onto the race itself and, and the course, the course choice and stuff like that, physiologically, Elliot, is he, if you were to design a, a runner in a lab, um, I remember reading <clears throat> a while ago, something to do with long shin bones being genetically something which is uh, disproportionately more in Kenyan athletes, which means that they're good. And then they need light feet and other bits and pieces and VO2 max and running efficiency. How, how does all that tie together for him? You, you, you've been reading the right stuff. Yeah. I've, been, I've so, been following you on Twitter, Alex. That's what's been happening. It, it, you know, so the, there's been this great mystery for the last 20 years. Like, why are the Kenyans so good? And let's figure out if we can copy it somehow. And so uh, there's all these all these things, like you said. So the, the, there's fa going back decades, there's been fascinating experiments where it's like, okay, let's take a, a, a light weight, you know, a, a few ounces, and let's strap it onto someone's foot or their shin or their hip or wherever, and let's see how their running efficiency changes. And what you find sort of not surprisingly is the farther away from the center of your body a weight is, the harder it is, the more, I mean, and you can think about that, you know, you hold a weight up in front of you. It's one thing you hold your arm out straight and hold a weight up. It's a lot harder. So if you have weight, extra, a little bit of extra weight, a tiny bit of extra weight on your feet, for instance, with shoes, that changes your efficiency quite a bit. So what that means is that it's very advantageous to have very long, but skinny, like no calf muscle legs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that gives you these levers that can propel you forward without paying that weight penalty. So, you know, th and this happens to be a, a sort of typical characteristic of people who grew up in the area that Kipchoge grew up in. Was Kipchoge, is Kipchoge a perfect running machine? So when Nike first embarked on this project a few years ago, they, I mean, and they sponsor a pretty large fraction of the best runners in the world. So they said, let's, they brought about more than two dozen of their best runners into the lab to say, let's, let's get out the calipers. Let's get out the treadmills. Let's measure all these guys and see who has the greatest endurance capacity. And Kipchoge was not at the top of the heap Do you know who by was? those measurements. Uh, there's a guy named Lalissa DeSissa who actually won the world championships this year. Um, so very good runner. He, and he's won Boston a couple of times. So he's, he, he's good. And, and, and they could see in the lab that he, he was off the charts. Um, but he has never run as fast as Kipchoge has. Kipchoge had good, like he had the kind of VO2 max and lactate threshold and running economy that you need to be a world-class runner, but he didn't have the kind that makes you say, this guy's a one in a generation talent. He's a, he's a world-class runner, but whatever makes him once in a generation is something that doesn't show up in those lab tests. How amazing is that? Like, how cool is that to hear that you've got this guy who is, you know, he's elite level, but not a freak. And there's something which can't be measured because everyone talks about it in sport, right? They all talk about this X factor. But I think increasingly now, as we get into the 21st century and we have pundits who are able to analyze with increasing dexterity and, and resolution on what's happening, we're becoming more and more cerebral about sport. We, we think more and more about the quantifiable metrics and to hear that we have someone that's got this difficult to define X factor. It's, it's so magic. He's just, he's a hero. Yeah. And it, you know, it, it's interesting because for me, 
again, I, I'm all about the science. I'm very interested in it. And you're absolutely right that our, our ability to analyze and understand the, the, the basis of success is getting better and better. But for me, the moment we reach the point where you can go into a lab, measure 10 people and, and tell, tell you with 99% certainty who's going to win a race and who isn't, that's the moment to me that sport loses its, its interest in a way. If, if, if you, if everything becomes quantifiable, then it's like, it's, it's just sport, you know, a race becomes a plumbing contest. Who's got the biggest aorta or whatever. Mm -hmm, And that's, mm -hmm. There has to be, there has to be some, something that we can't measure for it to be interesting. So uh, yeah, to me, that's, that's, that's some of the magic. And, and, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, you talk about the X factor. Uh, I guess I met Kipchoge for the first time, you know, what, three years ago, maybe. And it's easy to say this in hindsight, but he, he has an, uh, a presence that is, that is hard to quantify. And it's like, I'm not going to say I knew that moment that, yeah, he, yeah, you know, yeah. he was going to break two hours, but it's like. This guy has the, you know, some people, some people just have a presence where it's like this, you know, it's not a swagger because he's very humble and very mm. quiet, but you just, you, you feel that he's bigger than he is. And, 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 you know, that's, I think that's something that in some un, unquantifiable way that plays into his, his abilities. I'd love to see him at a party talking about swagger. Like I'd uh, love appa- to- apparently he likes to spin the tunes. Uh, in he? Vienna, he was, he was, uh, <laughs> he, 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 he was, there was a big dance that night and he was giving out prizes to all of his, uh, the pacemakers, these world-class runners who paced him. But uh, yeah, he, he, he's, he's not like a super party guy, but I think he can get down. After you've just run a sub two hour marathon, you got to at least have a beer or something, right? You gotta, you gotta chill out somehow. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta unwind. He, he takes a month off after a marathon like that and just wow. chills out. So he's not one of these obsessive people who's like, okay, I've already taken 12 hours off. I have to get my next workout in. Mm. He goes hard. Then he, then he relaxes and has a good time. Talking about the way that he has presence, there's a, a clip. Um, and if anyone goes back and watches the intro to the race, so the pacemakers at the very, very beginning of the race, the pacemakers are all there. And then Elliot walks through this gap in the barriers behind them. And I remember, so I haven't watched the full race. It was a silly time last week if I was in the UK and I'd work late and blah, blah. And I watched this clip and it it looks, I know this sounds weird and existential, but it, it looks like the universe just parts around him as he walks through those barriers. And it's like, it's like he's not moving. The universe is moving around him and he just parts through it, man. And you can just, the way he looks, you know, he's there with his, that look on his face and it's just, that's just where, where he's meant to be. So getting on to, getting onto the race itself, why did they choose Vienna? Yeah, it, it was a sort of global search for, for trying to find the best of all possible worlds for a bunch of different factors they had to optimize. Uh, one was they wanted a course that was flat as flat as possible with as few sharp turns as possible. They needed to get the temperature and the altitude and the humidity and all these things right. Uh, even from a logistical perspective, they needed to find a place where the city was willing to say, uh, yeah, we can guarantee you access to this for like a, 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 a two week period mm. because they didn't want to just say, we're going to run this race on October 12th or whatever. They, what they said when they, when they planned it is we're going to run it sometime between, I think it was like October 10th and 23rd or something like that. And they were going to decide at the last minute based on the weather forecast, because if it happens to be a little warm or rainy or something, they weren't going to do that. So, um, there were, and, and you know, when they, inig- when they were originally searching for places, they, they considered all sorts of options. They considered the world's largest indoor convention center, or at least North America, the largest convention center in North America in Chicago. It's so it's indoors, climate controlled, perfectly flat, huge. Uh, the problem with that one was that the air conditioning in the, in the building wasn't strong enough to get it as cold as they wanted. No way. Uh, they considered a dike in the Netherlands, which is perfectly flat for like 23 miles or something like that, and has a really reliable tailwind in one direction. So you could be, let's just run straight along this dike with a wind blowing. Yeah. They decided that would feel too much like cheating. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, and they, they even considered building like ice walls along a track uh, that would keep <laughs> keep it locally cool. Uh, I mean, they were, they were, and then like the Nike one ended up on a Formula One track in Northern mm-hmm. Italy. So it was like a 1.5 mile loop. Uh, then Vienna gave them longer straightaways, uh, and crucially, the one thing that's different, really, from between the Nike race two years ago and the Ineos race this year, is Kipchoge wanted crowd support. He wanted people cheering. It was it was sort of uh, deathly quiet 
at the, on the Formula One track, aside from just at the finish line, there were a few people, some people cheering. It was cheering. eerie. It was eerie when they set off, wasn't it? it yeah, it was like five in the morning. It was, it was misty. It, and they had these fluorescent lights. And oh, man, yeah. It, 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 Kevin it was, Hart it, there, just being loud, bouncing around. He was the only around. guy with any energy. Yeah, he was. <laughs> Um, yeah, so Kipchoge wanted wanted people cheering, and he got that in Vienna. And and uh, you know, I, I actually think if I, if I were designing it, I would want it to be deathly quiet for the first like 20, 25 or thirty k, because the marathon's supposed to feel easy for a long time, and you don't want to get too excited mm -hmm. too early in the race. Uh, so my optimal, if I were designing it, would be totally quiet, relaxed, just chilling out for twenty five thirty k. And then, then open the gate. Just when it's getting hard, yep. then you get some some crowd for for the next yeah for you get like medium crowd taper the crowd. And then for the last in. part yeah, okay, of it, it's yeah. like everybody go nuts. <laughs> so you kind of want to you want you want to have a, a a volume control in the crowd that I brings it, it brings it up. But anyway, he he got a crowd in Vienna, and so that's probably the 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 main difference from the last attempt. This route, if anyone was to to look at it, there's some go to at Sweat Science on Twitter, and you'll be able to see it. It's um from an aerial view, it's like a a lollipop stick. It's like a long thin thing with a little bump at one end, and then long all the way back with a longer roundabout at the top end, and then you go back down. One of the concerns that I'd seen you talking about was what do corners do, or corner that's this sharp, right? Because you got to do 180 degrees in the space of was that 25 meters, something like that. Yeah, the radius. So the radius of curvature was actually, if you think about a standard athletics track, you know, four hundred meter track, mm -hmm. uh, one of those little uh, lollipop ends was tighter than the curves on a, a track, mm -hmm. and so so that was a concern. And they got in touch with a guy at the University of Colorado who's one of the world experts in in running biomechanics, and they had him build a model of how much does it slow you down or how much extra energy does it take to go around a curve and and not to get too deep into the the you know, the, the vector diagrams of forces and stuff but if you're going around a curve you've got you've the force of gravity is always pressing you down and that's a big factor in how much energy you spend running then you've also got to spend a little extra energy turning so pushing uh, in, into the curve. Mm -hmm. And the result is that you effectively, the way you can think about it is you weigh a little bit more when you're going around a corner. And what they calculated is on the tight corner, the extra weight was the equivalent as if Kipchoge was carrying two and a half cups of water with him. So he, he's that much heavier when going around the corner mm -hmm. and what they, and so they ran the calculations and they decided it's no big deal. It's the, it, in the end, they, what they concluded is that course overall was, would, would would be about five seconds slower than if they'd been able to come up with a hypothetical track that was perfectly straight and perfectly flat and just, you know, 26.2 miles in a straight line along mm. like the salt salt flats of in, in the Utah desert or whatever. Yeah. So five seconds, like, you know, if he had run two flat zero and three <laughs> seconds, they would have said, God damn it, we should have gone to Utah. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, but they decided that that was pretty close. That it wasn't it wasn't a big deal. If it had been twenty seconds on the curves, thirty seconds on the curves, uh, they would have been more concerned. And the other thing they could have done is, if it had been significant, they would have altered the pace around the curves so that he wasn't working too hard around the curves. They would have said, let's slow down a bit on the curves mm -hmm. so that you're not pushing into the red zone. Got you. Okay, so we've got the track. We've got Kipchoge. He's been doing his hundred and forty miles a week, which is, I mean, that's got to be pretty extreme even for like a normal marathon prep is it it's, or is that is that in the the normal window for a world-class marathoner that's in the normal window it's right. it's on the high end it's um there's certainly people who do less but uh yeah if you go to the if you go to the start line of the olympic marathon and do a little survey you'll find quite a number of people will have hit 140 miles a, a week for such a while. an amount of volume though isn't it still so anyway we've got him there and then he's got how many how many paces 70 paces did you say He's got a, a total total group. I think it was forty one pacers, including like Olympic champions, world champions, so some of the best runners in the world, and who were getting paid reasonably well. I think, yeah. um, <laughs> and and they were divided into teams of I, I think it was uh, seven runners, five in front, uh, two behind. Yeah, exactly. The two behind was a was a was a sort of surprise. That was another difference from the, the last time because you'd say, well, who cares? Why why is there someone behind him? They're like push him forward if he falls down. But uh, they they ran these simulations, these uh, uh, wind tunnel tests and c computational fluid dynamic simulations and determine. And, and cyclists know this too because cyclists have thought about drafting before. It's faster to be in the middle of the peloton than at the back of the peloton. Mm -hmm. And the, the reason is you want the air to be as smooth as possible going past you. And if you're the, you're at the back, 
the air behind you is 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 kind of turbulent. Very messy. If you've got two people behind you, the the air just keeps flowing right past you, and then the turbulence is pushed back behind the last pacemaker. Yeah, if you've ever been driving on the motorway behind a big truck and you're close, and then that truck pulls away a little bit, and you start to then catch where those uh, those winds start to cross over. It's really ugly. It's like a lot of a, a lot of turbulence. That's exactly yeah. That's 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 the perfect analogy. Um, Kipchoge wasn't going as fast as a truck, but yeah. well, not. It <laughs> but, depends. Uh, I've seen some trucks in the UK that go about as quick as he did. So we've set them away. We've got a guy. We've got a man with a, a wonderful mustache who's one of the pacemakers. Great mustache. It might have been a couple of mustaches. Um, a lot more uh, white athletes than I actually thought at that very very top end of, of it. I would have thought it would have been. I think breaking two was heavily uh, Kenyan African based, and it seemed like Ineos had really pulled out every athlete from everywhere that they could. I, I think they were. I you know I'm not. I'm I'm speculating here. I suspect they were consciously uh, trying to make it a globally appealing event. So they had oh. uh, they had several American athletes. They had uh, Australian athletes. Uh, I can't remember if they had any they had British athletes. Um, Representative pacemakers, then. Yeah, yeah. So they, they, they were they brought together all of those guys were amazing. They're all you know near the the top end. They had, they had Norwegian athletes, the three Norwegian brothers, the Inga Britsons, who were the first time three brothers have ever made the World Championship final this year. So anyway, they had they had. They, I think they were uh, they weren't just saying let's find the cheapest pacemakers we can. <laughs> they were like let's find people who are all world class. But let's also give people around the world a, a reason to tune in. That's awesome. I really like that idea. So we're onto the race. They've set away. Uh, they actually started off on a section of the track that they only ever ran once, didn't they? So they yeah, start and, and off was, on this like inc- a decline. Sorry, and that's free time. So they th- so before they start before they got onto this loop, they did a about a five hundred meter down a bridge, which I think it descended. 13 14 meters and the calculation was that that actually saved about 10 seconds and before you say hey that's cheating uh the the official iwf rules for uh world records on in road races you're allowed to have a little bit of a downhill and it's uh, you're allowed to have a one in 1000 uh uh, ratio descent so that means for a 42 kilometer race you're allowed to go down for 42 meters uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And that and so and they they only went down I think thirteen meters so mm. they they t- they took advantage of about a third of the allowable downhill that they could have put in the race and you know ten seconds could have that's actually you know if, if anything it would have been nice if they could have got a, a little more downhill but of I course know, yeah. the bridge the bridge is so extend, long extend extend the bridge up a bit more you you want to have forty one point nine meters like you, <laughs> you, ideally you want to have that that descent and you probably want it at the end where they're tired but anyway they couldn't they couldn't uh, get everything work out how to do that uh, yeah. yeah exactly you'd have to kind of get the earth movers out to, to build the actual perfect course got you um so moving on to the race how did you because did you watch it live did you get to watch it live i did it started at two fifteen in the morning my time so <laughs> I, I have very few memories of the the first uh 45 minutes of the race but uh i finally was awake by about three in the morning i was like I think this is happening. I think this is going to going to be something. So What did you feel yeah, like? I, I, you're watching it, you're analyzing him, you know, this is what you do. How how did you you did you feel? Did he look worried at any point? Did you assess his running form? Yeah, you know, he, uh, so I d- I was worried at about just before halfway, he started to drift back a little bit. Uh he there a gap opened up between him and the pacemaker in front of him. And he didn't look too happy and I thought, man, if he's struggling now, I think this is going to be trouble now after the race he reportedly said people asked him about that because i wasn't the only person who noticed that and he was like no i don't know what you're talking about i felt great the whole way (laughs) so i don't know if that's just a little bit of revisionist history you know you don't always remember what you're thinking in the middle of the race or it was just he he was not you know not paying attention or something but so i was i was i was watching for little signs like that uh i was it was interesting because i so i was in for for the nike race a couple years ago i was there in italy and at that point, I ex- for that race, I expected to feel kind of cynical because it was, you know, it was a sort of big Nike marketing stunt mm-hmm. uh, as well as an athletic event. And I ended up feeling totally blown away by the sort of magical feeling of of that breaking two. So this time, I think my my expectations were a little higher. I was like, take me to that special place, Elliot. I want to, you know, uh, I feel it. Yeah. Feel- exactly. And you know, it was, it was special, but it was, it was less surprising because he'd already been within 25 seconds. So instead of feeling like, I can't believe he's doing this, I was more feeling like, I hope he doesn't screw up because, you know, there's no second place in this race. Like if he doesn't do it, 
th- that's 15 million pounds down the drain. And if that's everyone just, <laughs> and, you know, that's a night of sleep. Like I'll tell you, I was, I was wiped out for the whole weekend after watching that. So there, there was a little bit more of just kind of like, just do it already. Ellie. And I, I hate to say that it was still magical, but it was just, um, the second time is never the same as the first. I agree. I think to give Ineos, who are Ineos? They're like an engineering company, right? Is that yeah, right? they're a petrochemical company. In, uh, in obviously, in the, I mean, the tie-ins with running uh, make perfect sense. Yeah, of, co- of course. Yeah, yeah. Because if you want to you know, fuel up, I guess on the way home from the race. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I think I think they just wanted their their name out there. Yeah, I get it. Well, if you got the money, um, but yeah, there was something. You're right. I'll be interested to see. There'll be a after movie documentary thing coming so. out eventually yeah. i'm gonna i'm gonna guess um but yeah the the nike break into it really did feel very special like i loved i loved how the, you know they got kevin obviously it's nike like they've you know when you think about the people that they can call in like who the fuck's ineos like you know, they can call in like a like a petrol pump attendant or something <laughs> who's like really you once did a marathon but yeah like <clears throat> the nike one really did feel magical and you're right maybe the magic wasn't as optimal starting in this misty morning in Monza where they've got no crowd and it's just deathly silent. And you've got this Tesla that just, just pulls away and that's it. And like there was, but it was, it was special. And I wonder, and I wonder what would have happened had he have done it on that first time. I wonder how, how people might have changed and stuff. So I, Getting on to one of the more major controversies that's going on at the moment, before we talk about some other records that have been broken recently, the shoe that Elliot had on for the first one was was a, a again a new a, a new iteration of a, a line of shoes, and then they've then taken it up a notch for this. Can you can you talk us through how they relate? Yeah, and this is really important because I don't I don't think we can talk about this race without talking about the shoes uh, because I don't think we would be having this discussion or be here if it wasn't for a major change in shoe technology that took place in 2016 and nike introduced a new line of shoes uh which has two two distinct features one is a a stiff carbon fiber plate that goes through the 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 midsole and the other is that the the midsole was made of this new ultra light ultra resilient foam and by resilient i mean you squeeze it down and it springs back really quickly and so Marathon flats used to be as thin as possible. You wanted to be racing in a shoe that weighed nothing. And so they're basically just a piece of rubber wrapped around your feet. Now they're these big, thick, uh, you know, uh, more than an inch thick is is the sole of this foam, this lightweight foam. And then it's got a, a carbon fiber plate uh, through the middle of it. They and look comical. If you look at the, the shoes that they're wearing now at the start of the race, it looks funny. Look like yeah, platform shoes. It's it's sort of taking us back to the seventies. It's it, it, they they look like sort of running pimps or something like that. Uh, <laughs> it, and it's you know initially when Nike introduced these shoes, no one believed they worked. So they were like, oh, it's all a big stunt. You know, all the magic is in the drafting or or the 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 course, and they they're just trying to sell us these shoes. But it's become clear that no, the 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 data was true. These this shoes really are several percent better than any previous shoe, and. Th- the sort of all-time lists and and records have been rewritten over the last two years, and it's not just that one pair of shoes. So so Kipchoge was two years ago was wearing the initial line of the shoe. Since then, they've had a, a second iteration. It was the Vaporfly four percent, then the Vaporfly next percent, and now Kipchoge was wearing yet another shoe, which is even which looks even wackier than the previous ones because it's got these two pods under the forefoot in addition to the thick sole, and it's thicker, even thicker than the the initial like the initial ones were something like 31 millimeters thick and apparently the prototype although no one has been allowed to touch it yet is pushing 40 millimeters which is uh, i don't know if it, you know a lot of people have heard about hoka shoes which are these big super cushy maximalist shoes that that uh, with thick soles the nike shoes are even thicker than these sort of clown shoes that everyone used to make fun of wow. so it sparked a big controversy because <laughs> when you have a shoe that's that much better and it's made by one company, and and not everyone has access to the newest prototypes. Then you start to ask, "Hang on, uh, is it is it is the shoe determining who's winning the race? Have we moved to a Formula One model where it's an engineering competition rather than a stock car model where everyone's driving the same car?" Yeah, it is strange. I think you know, for me as someone who 
if you tried to put 26 and a bit miles in front of me, like you could put me in a pair of rollerblades and I'm not making it. But I, I wonder just how much of a difference the shoes make. I, I would be skeptical until reading and hearing more about it. I think, oh, it's just a pair of shoes. That can't make that much of a difference. So it, you know, if, if the goal is, uh, you know, me and my mates are going to run a marathon in, in a year just as a big challenge and we want to make it to the finish. Eh, you know, doesn't really matter about the shoes. If you're, if you're racing yourself and if you're trying to set a best time or if you're trying to hit an external time, like the Boston marathon qualifying standard or something like that, then all of a sudden you start really paying attention to uh, two minutes here, three minutes there. And there was a big, so for the elites, it's one thing. There was a big, the New York Times did a big crowdsourced analysis uh, a year or two ago where they, they used data from Strava, which is this uh, online platform that, you know, where people upload their their, their runs from GPS, including their races, and, the, and they sometimes record which shoes they're wearing. So they said, let's look at the same runners who have switched from one shoe to another, either from another shoe to the, to the Vaporfly or the Vaporfly to another shoe. And what they found was more or less exactly what Nike, Nike was claiming. The runners were a couple of minutes, a couple of percent faster in the Vaporfly than they were in other shoes. That's so crazy. So what's the what does that pod do? Have you got any idea what the, the pod is? that similar to the, is it the joy ride or the float ride that they've just brought out, that Nike have brought out? Oh, I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So that's that, the that's one a, that's got, that's a pod that's got little beads inside of the pod, like a beanbag. Um, oh, okay. So that's they, they recently brought that out, but the thing that Elliot's got looks a lot more like hardcore than that. Yeah. So the only the only information we have is that there was a patent filing uh, that someone unearthed that looks like Kipchoge's prototype, and so people are speculating that this is what's in his shoe. Uh, it's not clear that, it, but the, but the pod itself had these sort of fibers within it that get tensed and stretched. Uh, like this is serious space age shit, isn't it? Yeah, and here's the here's the thing. It's like shoe companies have been making these crazy claims for technology for as long as I've been alive. Every every year there's a new it's like we're we're introducing the Nike shocks. We're introducing, you know, the the gel this or the torsion that or whatever and it's and there's always this complicated plausible sounding explanation of why this is going to be the best thing since sliced bread. And the the sort of the heuristic that I learned over the years is just ignore all that because it's never true. It never makes a difference. All this stuff is just noise. And so that's why the Nike shoe caught everyone by surprise. So it was like, whoa, this really works. So yeah. now they're they're still doing the same thing. They're still so here's these po- pods and the pods have torsion or beads or whatever the heck you want. My default is still to say it probably doesn't do anything. Let, like let's just ignore what that is. We've been wrong once. The carbon fiber plates and the foam really did do something. Mm-hmm. And we'll see whether the pods do something more. But it, that may the pods may just be sort of a, you know, pay no attention to the to the, you know, the man in the the big hat or whatever, like a, a distraction to the fact that they actually the other thing in this prototype or in this patent application is they suggested they could have up to three carbon fiber plates mm. in the shoe. So may, maybe it's all, still all about the carbon fiber plates and the foam or maybe the pods do something but that claim hasn't been tested by by scientists unlike the carbon fiber plate got you so what have been some of the criticisms then of of this particular run from the running purists and the people that you'll you'll have to see having their bickerings online what what have people been saying yeah well the, you know how long do you have because there's <laughs> there's lots of criticism <laughs> uh, you know there's there's a there's a there's two basically two basic things one is the sort of general criticism of exhibition races like this that this should have been done, you know, like my grandfather used to run a marathon. You know, this is how we run races and this is how it always should be. Mm. I hate all this publicity and this <laughs> advertising. And I think that's that's basically grumpiness. And I, I you know, Curmudgeons. I understand whatever, but I'm, yeah, I'm not – to me, that doesn't carry a lot of water. If, they don't, if they're not interested, they don't have to pay attention to it. Mm-hmm. The, the other criticism is more based on the shoes. And, you know, to, to understand that you have to go back to 2016. Uh, so no one knew these shoes existed. They weren't publicly announced until mid 2017, but a select few Nike runners were given prototypes of the shoes, which were specially fabricated to disguise what they were. They were disguised as zoom streak sixes. So they looked like old shoes, but they actually had these carbon fiber plates and the foam in them. 
they took these shoes, they went to the Olympics, they swept the top three spots in the men's marathon, and they also won the women's marathon. No way. So now you've got a situation where you've got a shoe that helps, and only a few people have it, and they're take, sweeping the medals. And so people are like, that's not fair. That's not fair. The, the, a race should be among the runners, not among who happens to be favored by Nike uh, and given the best shoes. And I have, I, I have a lot of sympathy for that argument. In fact, I agree with it. I think that was not that was not kosher, and that that should not be done. Now, the IAAF, the the governing body of track, changed the rules the next year to say, okay, any shoe that we're not going to ban carbon fiber plates, but any shoe used must be widely available to all. Uh, in the spirit of the university universality of athletics now that rule is now on the books but it hasn't changed anything people are using prototypes elite athletes are still using unreleased prototypes so i don't know why they put the rule in if they're not actually going to be mm. enforcing it um but that's where so that's where i think the real meat of the controversy is first of all is it is it fair to have these shoes and that's a i, I think banning the shoes uh, you know I, I can see arguments on both sides but there should definitely be regulations or rules to make sure that there aren't that only a few people you don't have the situation where only a few people have a shoe and nobody else doesn't and it's making an appreciable difference that's just not how the well, olympics what, what about if what about if the shoe's available to all but you're you as an athlete you are with a different sponsor yeah so that gets a little uh that gets tricky. And there have been some amazing, amazing instances of runners at like the world championships running in the Nike shoes, but having painted them to look like their, their, New their balance own sponsor or shoes. Asics or yeah, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Pa- painting the end for New Balance onto the vapor flies oh and they get busted. God. People, people are there with, with cameras and they're like, look at this dude. And I personally <laughs> know a couple of people who've lost their sponsorships because they raced Shit. in Nike shoes. Yeah. Um, and I, and I, and you know, there's, I, there's a guy, I know a number of, you know, elite marathoners with, with sponsorships. And one of them was saying recently, it's like, I have to decide, is it worth it to me? The relatively small amount of money that I get from shoe company X mm-hmm. to race in a slower shoe, or should I just give up my sponsorship so that I can, cause maybe I'll make so much more prize money if I'm a minute or two faster. Yeah. So this is, this is a real challenge. And I think the best case scenario there's a few different paths we could go, but probably the best case scenario is that other shoe companies come out with com- comparable shoes mm-hmm. and then everyone, we can be back to where we were mm-hmm. t- five years ago where it's like, yeah, there are differences between shoes, but it's not determining races. And there are uh, at least three and probably more companies that have their elite runners uh, racing in prototypes that have carbon fiber plates in them. So I think that's, and in fact, uh, we were talking about this before we started recording, uh, last weekend, the Ironman World Championships the res- in uh, in Hawaii, Jan Ferdino from Germany set a new course record at the Ironman World Championships. He was wearing Asics shoes, but they had a carbon fiber plate in them. So um, th- that's maybe one way that the playing field is going to be re-leveled is that everyone else is going to catch up. And everything, so these shoes are going to be widely available. The only difference is now that 10 years on 10 years, all the numbers are going to be maybe 2% to 4% quicker across the board so before before we started there was a, a screenshot that i saw it's quite cool for anyone who wants to keep up to date with um the new shoes and what's going on protos of the gram p-r-o-t-o-s of the gram on instagram is quite a cool um account and they reshared a post from a guy called ryan holt now I'll, I'll read this out and then i'll let you i'll let you take us through what's actually happening here alex but so uh at ryan hall three with all due respect to Eliud Kipchoge, as he is quite clearly the greatest marathoner of all time, irregardless of the shoes he is in, when a shoe company puts multiple carbon fiber plates in a shoe with cushion between the plates, it is no longer a shoe, it's a spring and a clear mechanical advantage to anyone not in those shoes. I'm just hoping that IAF Athletics make sure that the upcoming Olympics and WM Majors are fair playing fields for athletes of all brands. And then this Protos of the Gram has reshared that photo and said, can someone please tell Ryan Hall 3 that the new ASICS prototype his wife ran a marathon PB in has, uh, as we quote, Jan Frodenos interview, think of it as a rocking chair. It has a carbon fiber plate in and is the answer to the 4% of the competition. As we also quote Sarah's answer in the Let's Run.com interview, ran in a prototype of the new Asics Marathon shoe. It does not have a carbon fiber plate, so I do not attribute my PR to the shoe. Why are you lying, Sarah? Other brands need to up their game to catch up to Nike running. 
<laughs> I love it. Like I, I said, love, there's I love a it, lot man. of uh, a lot of argy bargy going on here. <laughs> so what's happening? Break that down for us. Yeah. So Ryan Hall is one of the greatest American marathoners in history. Uh, he retired a few years ago. Um, he's he uh, he placed pretty highly at the London Marathon in one one of his first marathons. He ran like two oh six. So ve- a very very well known athlete here in North America. His wife Sarah Hall is still competing and recently in in Berlin ran a two twenty two marathon, making her the I think it's the fourth fastest American in history. So these are two a couple which are who are both among the fastest marathoners both in history. Freaks. <laughs> both sponsored by Asics. Ah. Uh, so Ryan is is getting a little preachy here about Nike. And this is one of the sort of dynamics that makes this shoe in- debate so interesting is that everyone's got a vested interest. The people, you know, everyone who's defending it, everyone who's criticizing it. If you're an elite runner or involved in elite running, almost everyone at, in, in that world has an affiliation to a shoe company. So it's hard to to, to tease out uh, what's a sort of principled stand against, you know, uh, technology and running shoes and what is it like, Hey, that's no fair. I wish yep. I had those shoes. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so, so anyway, in the comments, yeah. So, um, you know, Ryan Hall is criticizing these, uh, spring shoes. And I think that's, uh, I think that reflects on him, maybe an imperfect understanding of what's going on with the shoes. Cause they're, they're not, they're not springs any more than any other pair of shoes is a spring. Every, every shoe has squishy midsoles and they act as a spring. Mm. The carbon fiber plate isn't a spring. It's a stiffening, a stiffening element. But anyway, that's, that's kind of beside the point. Mm-hmm. Um, Ryan's calling out, uh, these shoes. Someone else is pointing out, uh, actually your wife ran an unreleased prototype in Berlin, uh, just a few weeks ago. And they were speculating that it was the same carbon fiber plate prototype mm-hmm. that uh, Jan Frodino ran at the at the Ironman uh, World Championships last week. Uh, however, Sarah Hall has gone on record as saying that actually her prototypes don't have a carbon fiber plate. Mm-hmm. Now, she still did say that they're unreleased prototypes, and the IAAF rule is pr- is crystal clear now that you can't run in shoes that aren't generally available to all. So yes. I'm I'm a little mystified by w- whether this rule is just there for decoration or whether you know it's going like, to be enforced at some point. Yeah, or they. I mean, I guess they need to give a warning because it's happening so commonly. But it, it's it's pretty clear to me that that she's she's publicly saying yes, I did this thing that is against the rules. So I I, w- I would be a little cautious if I were Ryan and Sarah about mm. chucking chucking stones through windows because they they are as far as I can tell in in violation of the rules. But the point the point is, <clears throat> Ryan's argument appears to be predicated on the fact that this carbon fiber uh, plate shoe technology is advanced. Any other technology advances, uh, as you've said before, they're just kind of nondescript and they don't really matter. But obviously, that shoe, let's say that ASICs have come up with something, they probably haven't, but let's say that they've come up with something which is even better than a carbon fiber plate. You've still contravened the rules, you've still used something which is an unreleased prototype, all that you're, you're just, it's apples and oranges here, right? Like it's, you, you're, you're criticizing one thing because of its type, not because of the, the principle. That, that's exactly it. And and the history of the carbon fiber plate is actually very, very, very interesting because it Nike didn't invent this carbon fiber plate. Uh, in fact, Adidas is the company that sponsored the development of the carbon fiber plate. And they had, in fact, Haley Gabriel Selassie set a marathon world record in Adidas shoes in 2007 that had a carbon fiber plate. The guy who developed that carbon fiber plate, not to get into the nitty gritty here, but he's an academic at the University of Calgary here in Canada. Mm-hmm. One of his PhD students then went to Nike and no developed the vapor plumbing. So there's a clear the, How cool the carbon is fiber that? plate that came, that is in the Nike shoe is a direct lineal descendant of the one in the Adidas shoe. And the same with the foam, that Nike's foam does exactly what Adidas' uh, foam, which was called the Boost, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. did. And they had five consecutive world record marathon records in the Boost foam, which was resilient. So all the ingredients of the Nike shoe are things that other shoe companies, and, and Adidas wasn't the only one, uh, Fila and Asics, and I think uh, Hoka all had carbon fiber Yeah, there's a little shoes. list. there was a little list at the bottom of that thing. Hoka has a plate, Asics, Brooks Running has a plate, Saucony, New Balance have plates. Get with the yeah. times. And, and and some of those have been since the, the Vaporfly, but some of them were long before the Vaporfly. So people are all of a sudden saying, oh my God, carbon fiber plates are cheating. It's like nobody cared about carbon fiber plates when they weren't beating you. So there's, I think there's a lot of <laughs> self-interest in, in, in the criticism. And that's why I, I, I'm sort of skeptical of the we should ban carbon fiber plates because 
people are getting self-righteous about the plate itself. And it's like, it's not the plate. It's the fact that it works. Mm. That's the problem. And, and so j there, there was a proposal published uh, yesterday or the day before in the British Journal of Sports Medicine on how to regulate shoes, how to g stop it from getting out of hand so that people don't end up wearing what look like ski boots or something like that, disconnected from what we think of as running boots. And they said, look, let's not get bogged down with like, can you have a carbon fiber plate? No. Well, what about a fiberglass plate? Can you have a plastic plate? Mm -hmm. well, how long can the plate be? Let's get every, before every race, you have to go through the MRI and test your shoes. <laughs> that's, that's a, that's a pain in the neck. Let's just put a limit on the thickness of shoe soles that already exists for high jump shoes. Cause, uh, I can't remember 40 or 50 years ago. So someone started being like, Hey, if I'm trying to jump high, why don't I just wear platform shoes? And so they started wearing thicker and thicker <laughs> shoes. So the IWF said, okay, you can only have shoes this thick. Like, well, I don't know the exact number mm. to, to do high jump, which made sense. So they should do the same for running shoes. You can, and this is what the proposal is from, from in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. Within Let's those say, dimensions, you can fit whatever technology you want. Yeah. You just got this much room that you can put it in. Yeah. Let's say you have 31 millimeters. You can stick a carbon fiber plate. You can stick two. You can stick your fancy pods or whatever you want, but you're not going to have unlimited real estate because what's happened with the, with the, uh, the three successive versions of the Vaporfly is they've gotten thicker and thicker. They've gotten about 25% thicker to the point where it really, they really do look funny. Uh, and it's so not weird. all about just, yeah, it's not all about aesthetics, but it's a point where it's like running supposed to be a simple sport. Let's make sure it doesn't look like you're like it's a, a an equipment dominated sport. So let's just put take the simplest rule possible and at least say you cannot wear platform shoes. Mm, yeah, totally right. I guess as well, the thing is, there would come a time where you would add so much uh, thickness onto the bottom of the shoe that it would become heavy, so heavy that you would then begin to lose marginal gains if there was a like uh, if you got rid of this particular ruling and we're like, right, people have started wearing seven inch thick uh, soles, but how does that change your running mechanics and your running gait? How does that then add weight onto the bottom of the leg and stuff like that? So yeah, I think whoever's come up with that British uh, Journal of Medicine or whatever it was of, of sports science, I think that's a fairly good approach. So there was there was something else that you'd mentioned before. Have there been some other records that have been broken recently? There was the Ironman, there was, there was Elliot, and then what else? Yeah, so the, the women's record women's world record for the marathon went down the day after Elliot Kipchoge's sub two. Uh, and this was, to me, it was actually more surprising than Elliot because Elliot was already 25 seconds from the barrier. We kind of knew that it could happen, even though it wasn't going to be easy. But then the next day in Chicago, uh, Bridget Cosgay broke Paula Radcliffe's uh, marathon world record. Paula, Paula's record had uh, was 215.25 and it had stood since 2003. And basically no one had come within a well, not a mile, but no one had come within shouting distance of that record. Uh, uh, Mary Catani, I think, was the second fastest, and she was like 217 something. Miles off. So, yeah, yeah, like ages, ages off. And then out of nowhere, out of absolutely nowhere, uh, or, you know, not completely nowhere, but very surprisingly, all of a sudden, Bridget Koske, this Kenyan uh, runner, ran 214.04. So smashed Paula's record by over a minute. Um, in Chicago, uh, off a very fast pace, it wasn't even optimally paced. And after the race, she said, "Yeah, I think a lady can run two ten. I'm going to keep trying." So it's like, what? You know, and 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 needless to say, the important, you know, maybe the first thing I should say is she was wearing uh, Nike's Vapor Flies. <laughs> so it you sucks, know, we have to recalibrate. Though, doesn't, doesn't it suck that we're all, that this is the discussion that we're having now? That every performance that's good's got to be caveated with an asterisk that's talking about it was in this pair of shoes. I re I hope I really do hope for the sport that they just work out what the rule is, implement it, hard lines, and and everyone can get back to to talking about running. I 100% agree. It's 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 unfortunate that that's the discussion, and so it's understandable that some people would say, therefore, we wish the shoe had been banned, you know, strangled at birth, and just gotten rid of. And and maybe that would have been the best situation, but it's not. It's not what's happened. And at this point, I think there'd be it would be more trouble or more disruptive than than it's worth to try and like erase all the records that have been set in these shoes. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to say, okay, this is where we're at. But let's put, and this is what the British Journal of Sports Medicine paper says, let's let's put a limit on where we're at now and not let it go any farther. Let's, and then, because the, the most disorienting thing is when the, the standards are changing every six months and, and mm -hmm. it's getting faster. Once, once they settle into a new stasis, even if it's faster than it was five years ago, we'll, 
we'll we'll get used to that. Yeah. Because we've we've gotten used to it in many other sports before. It's like, oh, okay, now speed skaters have clap skates on. Everyone's faster than they were in the 90s, but we're not arguing about it every six months. It was There was a brief period of disruption in the late 90s, and then it was done. And even with the swimsuits in, in 2010, I guess it was, you know, records were just falling, falling, falling. They said, okay, here's where we're going to set the line of mm-hmm. what swimsuits are allowed. And then since then, it's, it's kind of a non-issue now. So I, I think running can do that, but they need to, they need to set a, you know, set some rules now so that people understand what the parameters are and what's allowed and what's not. It's interesting. It's quite a philosophical debate or quite a philosophical thought about what are you allowing to be enhanced with regards to an athlete? For instance, if you were, if someone had come up with some unbelievable new intra-workout nutrition drink, which was able to fuel muscles at 10 times the the pace or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Like if it was, where are we allowing this to happen and where are we not? I think it's because it feels somehow because the shoe is not a part of the athlete, it is not literally integral to the athlete is perhaps why people feel a bit sort of icky about it. Yeah, I mean, it's funny you should say that because the, the other innovation in the last two years has been a new sports drink uh, called Morton made by a small Swedish company, where it has Morton M A U R T E N. Okay, cool. And the, the, the claim is that it has these two ingredients, pectin and alginate, I think they're made from like seaweed or something like that. You, and it's other than that, it's a standard sports drink. It's got a bunch of carbohydrates in it. You swallow it. And when the, when those ingredients get in your stomach, they react with the stomach acid to create a hydrogel which kind of encapsulates the carbohydrates, effectively sort of hiding them from your stomach. Normally, if you try and take in a bunch of carbohydrate when you're exercising, uh, you reach a point where it, you can't handle anymore. Your stomach rebels and you either get diarrhea or you vomit mm-hmm. or, you just, or you just feel like crap. Mm-hmm. The hydrogel hides this carbohydrate. It's in your stomach, but you don't eat, you're, not, you're, you're not detecting it. it. Then it goes into your intestines and is absorbed into your bloodstream. So the claim is that you can drink much higher concentrations of carbohydrate uh, and to get more fuel in during a marathon or other endurance activity without messing up your, your gastrointestinal system. And this has swept the endurance world in the last couple of years. It's, uh, pe- everyone loves it. There's been no data showing that it actually works the way it claims. Uh, you know, my, my question is always, how do we know you're not just pooping out a bunch of hydrogel, mm-hmm. you know, six hours later or 12 hours or whatever the deal is. Mm-hmm. Um, but Kipchoge, for example, is, swears by Morton. Elliot Kipchoge does. Uh, lots of the top endurance athletes in the world. So there ha- and, and no one is saying, ban hydrogels. This is unacceptable. Um, now, p- partly that's because no one knows whether it really for sure makes such a big difference. It's, yeah. really, it's much easier to finger. But I think what you say is also true that it really it's a it's a sort of what does it feel like test. And, and uh, you know, the role of sports technology or the role of AIDS and technology is, is a tricky issue. Um, you know, I've been writing recently about electric brain stimulation with the idea that you, you hook up electrodes to your brain, um, run some current through your and, and, and it makes you able to push a little harder for about an hour or two. And I've been really wrestling with that. So it fe- that also feels icky to me. Why? Should it be banned? Why would I say that should be banned, whereas, you know, all these other things like sports drinks shouldn't caffeine. be banned? Yeah, caffeine. It's taking a pill and it makes you faster or taking a, a coffee or whatever. So I don't think there's a, I don't, people, the people who say it's 100% obvious that X should be banned and Y shouldn't be banned. I, I, I don't agree with them. I, I think it's it's always going to be a subjective line and what we need to do, what sports governing bodies need to do and fans like us need to do is think about what 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 makes us feel comfortable or uncomfortable. What is it about? So running, for example, is a very simple sport, right? Like we were talking about earlier. So the the to have a big effect of an external technology like shoe feels different than it would in a sport that's much more gear dependent, like cycling. Cycling, of course, your gear matters. It's not you. You know, you're never going to claim that the bike is irrelevant. But in running, we at least have the illusion that it's, you know, mano a mano. And so I think we have less tolerance for technology like that. And I think that's okay. I think we have to re- respect the cultures of different sports. Totally right. So what I wanted to finish on was uh, an article which I'd seen you sharing recently to do with the is it the suicide pace that people go out at, <laughs> yeah, at runs. Yeah. And I, I found that I found that really just fascinating. Can you can you take us through that? Yeah, sure. So the the, the World Athletics Championships uh, just wrapped up 
last month in uh, or a few weeks ago in uh, Qatar, and you know I, I spent a week or whatever watching all these races, uh, uh, streaming them online. And there was something really unique about this year, which was that the the the, the dis- middle distance and long distance races almost universally went out really really fast. Not like let's just judge our pace carefully and go fast, but like I'm going to go out. And I'm, I might die, but anyone who's going to come with me is going to die too. <laughs> and that's really unusual because the, the, for the last 15 or 20 years, um, the standard thing in endurance, in championship racing, not, not time trial racing, but in trying to win a goal, let's say the Olympics, is everyone goes out really slowly and watches their competitors because there's a real sense that if you're out in front, you're the hunted. And mm. if you're lurking behind someone, you're the hunter. And there, there's some aerodynamic stuff to, to do that if you're leading you're you're sort of breaking wind for everyone else but it's i think it's more than that it's psychological this feeling of if you're the one who's stalking your prey you can choose one to pounce and then when you see the finish line you pounce you go by them they don't have a chance to react and it's over so it, it's sort of like these cycling pursuit races where they almost go as slow as possible it's crazy when you see that isn't it when they're it's doing like those big U turns up and down yeah it's so hilarious yeah and th- th- those races can be fun to watch but it's interesting because then you end up with really slow times and 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 then this year was totally different. There were none of those sort of cat and mouse chess match games. It was like gun goes, I'm throwing down the gloves and I am going balls to the wall to see uh, and and see, see who can last. And so the times were extraordinarily fast and just the way they were run. So I, I ran some analyses. I, I I calculated what I called the kamikaze index. Mm-hmm. How fast did the races start compared to their average pace? And it's and it turned out that this year was anomalous compared to the last twenty years. It was the there's there's this cultural shift for some reason, and, and it's hard to know. Like, did 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 all the runners you know did one runner do it, and then everyone else was like, whoa, it worked for that guy. I'm going to try that, and someone well, I'm going to try that, and everyone mm-hmm. tried. So it was it's interesting to watch. It's not that one type of race is better than than others, but it was fascinating to see uh, people letting it all hang out, and it and, you know just from a personal perspective and a sort of applying this to general life and to all the rest of us, it, it, it made me look back at the way I often run races, which is very cautiously. I don't want to blow up. Mm. And I've, I've thought a lot about this in, in, you know, in recent years, just in the context of endurance that I think if you really want to find your limits, sometimes you have to blow up. Sometimes you have to go out too fast. Yeah. Um, and you know, hopefully you go out faster than you usually do and you discover, Oh wait, I can maintain. I can this. hold on. Yeah. Yeah. And that's great. Then you set a new best time. Sometimes you discover, Ah no no! It turns out I too can't fast, hold that. Too fast. That's fine. So you gotta you gotta chalk that up as as uh, as a valuable learning experience and say, uh, if you really want to find out what your limits are, sometimes you've got to exceed them and crash and burn. Yeah, I I love that. And you're right as well. There's part of me that just loves the idea of of someone going out beyond what they usually would and then watching them hold on. It's the same way. So the CrossFit opens out at the moment, and right now, uh, workout twenty point two just got released, which is just a, a grinder, 20 minute uh, AMRAP of uh, dumbbell thrusters, toes to bar, and double unders. And it's just the grippiest, longest, most painful thing that Dave Castro has ever programmed. It's savage. And uh, <laughs> I'm watching the guys in the gym do it this morning. And Jordan, who has got the same score as Khan Porter, the guy that did the announcement, uh, Jordan, who's ex regionals athlete in Newcastle, absolute freak. And I'm watching him go out, and it's a 20 minute workout, and he's going sub one minute from the get-go. So he's doing rounds in 45 to 50 seconds. His transitions are rapid. And I'm like, oh, he's gone hard. Because once you've set yourself on that, it's the same with running, right? It's your splits. It's like, okay, I'm on this particular split, whatever it might be. You want to try and run negative splits. You want to try and run quicker if you can. And I'm watching, I'm thinking, he's going to have to hold on. Sure enough, uh, three, two, one, and time. Clock goes, Jordan's straight outside because he needs to make sure that if he throws up, he throws up in a drain. <laughs> and he's just like, I want to watch that. I want to, and I want to watch that yeah. on the world stage as well. I want to know that professionals can be um, as giddy and as uh, caught in the moment as as we can. And you want to see them stretch their limits, not just totally under control the whole way. You want to see the fear in their eyes two thirds of the way. <laughs> yeah. like, uh, Did you see uh-oh. that with Is some this- of the athletes? Oh yeah, oh yeah. You could, and you can see, and, and and some of them did blow up. Some some of the people who tried to stay with them, like when 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 you when the races go like that, you see carnage. You <laughs> you see what happens when a world class athlete hits the wall, and, and uh, yeah, it's it's. I mean, 
I, I'm not saying I, I, I'm sure they didn't enjoy it, but it's, it's fun to see. Cause then, you know, yeah, this is, this is legit. This is, the, they're, they're stretched to their it's limits their here. There's limit. no, yes. Yeah. I love it. Um, final thing, just as a parting point, the one thing that we haven't actually said, how fast was Elliot Kipchoge running during his marathon attempt? Uh, it, in brief, I would say faster than most people could, like I've, I've chatted to a lot of people. There's, there's a lot of people in the world. Most people in the world just wouldn't be able to like sprint that fast for 10 seconds. Like he was doing 434 per mile, maybe 433. Uh, and that's like two, 249 per kilometer. So that's, it's for a 200 meters. That's, uh, something like 33, 34. So 16 to 17 seconds per hundred meters. So is that, um, is it about 12 miles an hour? Is that it? What is it in uh, car fa- pace? Faster. So, so it's 13 and a bit miles an hour. <laughs> and then the difference between 12 and 13 is enormous when you're at that speed. 13 and a bit miles an hour in a car is a, a moderately heavy accident. You know what I mean? Like I'm, if you fall over at that pace, you're going to skid for a while. Yeah, I, I mean, I think a lot of people would have would be challenged to keep up with him on a bike, uh, <laughs> it, certainly for for longer than you know a, a brief sprint. Like, it it it's it's almost unfortunate that he's such a smooth looking runner and that he was surrounded by pacemakers who are among the best in the world because you don't realize how fast he was going. Except sometimes during the broadcast, you see off to the side someone has decided outside the barricades <laughs> to run along beside him, <laughs> and what you see is someone who looks quite fit, who's probably like a a very serious recreational runner, and they are just absolutely. <laughs> pegging it absolutely go you know just giving it with their whole being and they last you know 15 seconds tops it's, and then you're like oh okay just because he's, this is quick looks relaxed he, just because he's gliding along as if he's you know floating on air doesn't mean he's not really booking it <sighs> man how fascinating alex today has been absolutely awesome to the listeners uh who didn't catch our first episode number 49 i want to say 48 or 49 it was the first episode of this year it's still in the top 10 of all time plays on modern wisdom it will be linked in the show notes below i implore you to go and check that out also endure alex's book absolutely fantastic great analysis if you're into this and like i said at sweat science on twitter everything will be linked in the show notes below any questions that you've got go hassle alex he's on twitter all the time or leave them in the youtube comments below uh i can't i I want i want there to be some more athletic stuff coming up so that i can i can hassle you again i can get you back on man it's a great thing every year there's something new awesome (laughs) alex thanks so much for your time it's been great thanks Chris. this was really fun to to go into the nitty-gritty Yeah, yeah,